Hey, to the Hive of This Podcast. I'm your host, Daniel Martinez. Today, we have a special guest, developer, longtime real estate investor, Anthony Amanategi. Daniel, how are you? I'm good, man. I'm good today. I am uh, honored to be on the Hive Mind, man. Your show is awesome, and I, I, I watch it, and I'm, I'm just amazed that you've invited me on. Thank you very much for the invitation. Well, I think we connected because you had me on your podcast, which is the Future Factory podcast. So I think we can make a plug to that first. But I appreciate you having me on. So it's an exchange. So exchange of value, exchange of information, and exchange of time. So I appreciate you coming coming back and giving me your time. Absolutely. <laughs> so I always ask this, where, what part of the country are you from and how long have you been in real estate? Because I know you've been in real estate for a very, very long time and you have a lot of experience. So what part of the country are you from? East so Florida? I'm actually originally born and raised in South Florida, right? I grew up in Boca Raton, Florida, and uh, I was born in Fort Lauderdale, grew up in Boca. And I moved up to Chicago about 30 years ago. I worked for a company, a development company called Discovery Zone that uh, ultimately became uh, Blockbuster Video. And from there, I worked for multiple brands. I, I, you know, I was internal as a development partner for companies like Boston Market, Einstein Bagels, Aubon oh, wow. Pan, Panera Bread. Those were all the you know brands I'd, I'd worked inside for as a development person. Oh wow! So twenty five years. You still live in Chicago? I do. I still still live in Chicago. I uh, I live in Oak Park, Illinois. Okay. Okay. I grew up in Hammond, so I, I was a little over the border, and that's where I spent. 21 years of my life. <laughs> That's great. Hey, Hammond's a great town, right? It's, it's a little sleep, a little quieter, but uh, it's right. Uh, you know, you've got Chicago within an hour. Or you're you're uh, uh, you got Indiana, which is kind of cool. So, uh, I, I, you know, it's, it's a sweet place to grow up. Yeah, my dad. We moved out of Chicago because Chicago's a little rough in some areas, and then the commute. Everybody that li lived in Indiana usually commuted to work somewhere in Illinois. So when I became of age, I worked in Joliet and I worked in Cicero. So I would still have to commute through work. And my dad was a construction worker, so he had to commute all over Illinois. So it's always interesting to everybody from Indiana going to Chicago to go work. And uh, it's an interesting dynamic that it is up there. Well, Chicago what was good, it was, what's fun about it was you the taxes are a lot less. So you can buy, you get a lot more home. You know, it, it kind of makes sense if you're not bad with the, with the commute. And for guys like your dad who are moving job sites everywhere anyways, you know, you get a lot more house value for it. And, and we're going to talk about real estate today. We're really going to look at kind of the overall cost for developing real estate, right? Looking at, at, at value and what you're trying to get out of it, kind of your long-term positioning. We're, we're going to talk about that in the podcast. So I, I think it's kind of interesting when, when people say, you know, when you, when you come from a place like Hammond, you got a lot more property for a lot less buck. 100%. So let's talk about development because I think you working with like uh, all these major chains and development side of it, it's it takes a lot of capital, it takes a lot of expertise, and you're doing it in like all 50 states from what I from what I heard. I know you're working to operate in a lot of the states at all as a whole. So how does it like operating and managing a team and what does it take to, to, to get into that development field working with the, with these QSRs? You know, all businesses, you know, I, we own nine separate companies and right? some real estate yeah. trusts and uh, different investment groups that we work with. And, it, it, you know, Daniel, when we and I talk, it's it's running a company and all companies, no matter what they are, that it's the same. It's the same exact thing. If you're an entrepreneur, I really want you to get this. All a company is, it's an idea, right? It doesn't matter what it is, matter what your idea is, it's just an idea, right? And then the whole idea about a company is that you expand on that idea and then you organize, right? So all a company really is every single day is an idea that we expand and organize. Now, what I mean by that is most people don't, don't get this, right? Most people make it out to, well, I want to be a billionaire. Great. You want to be a billionaire. How are you going to do that? Right? Well, I want to do it in real estate. Great. How are you going to do that? Well, I want to be able to buy real estate and, and, and make some money and make it great. How are you going to do that? Right? So let's look at what does it mean to go out and buy real estate, right? So uh, for us, we work in all 50 states. So for us, we have a, a very, you know, I, I just walked out of, before I walked in here, I just walked into out of, out of a process meeting, right? So if you look at the groups that we work with, uh, you know, we have people all around the country. Now, there's no possible way that me or all the vice, pres vice presidents that work for a company could be at every project everywhere okay. there are. There's just no way they could do that. Daniel, they would they would go insane. In fact, we've tried and it's very, it's not very effective, right? You know, you're, you try to go everywhere and be everything, everybody, you can't. So the idea is that we really got to spend a lot of time in developing processes and have it to a point where everybody, the idea of what we're doing here at corporate headquarters is translated over to each and every team, right? And each and every team, it recreates it just like we do here, right? So that the way that we think about property, the process that we follow to make sure the property is a, is a deal worth us doing, that that process 
is the same no matter where we go. It's not reinterpreted a different way and that we don't change the patterns by which we execute for success, right? Yeah. So if, if you look at it and we were, we're, you know, we're always looking at how do we organize and, and train to the nth degree so that our idea, uh, our process and what we're trying to achieve here is the same over there, not reinterpreted in a different way. Gotcha. This show is sponsored by Hive Mind CRM. It is more than just a CRM. It is a real estate and business mastermind that comes with an all-in-one CRM. You can have unlimited websites and users. You can call, text, RVM, and email all-in-one user interface. And you can set up custom automations for any type and multiple businesses. 65% of companies start using a CRM system within the first five years of business. Once implemented, the hive mind will save you on marketing, give you more time, and make more money. One of our users had his first $100,000 a month using our system in June. We want to see you automate and accelerate your business. Text us at 210-972-1842 for future meetings. And of course, to get our $1 course on how to make more than six figures on one land deal. You can schedule your free demo today at hivemindcrm.io. How do you hire good people? Well, there's, there, there's, there's a, you know, magic wand. I would just tell you that we we've, we've hired a couple of, of 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 witches and they just use magic wands. No, I'm kidding. You know, it, it's a uh, that's a trick, right? Because with that, you know, if, it goes back to setting up the process. And I, I think if you look at everything that we do as a company, as we look at our organization, right, trying to figure out what is the role that people are going to do. Now, ultimately, you got to know. You know, we've messed up more people. We've we've hired more great people and messed them up because we we're not crystal clear about what they're going to do. In fact, I would tell you that when I first started the company, I didn't even know what. Look, we were organizing. Right when, when, when I started CDO Group, there was no such thing as outsourced construction management. There was no such thing. You know, twenty five years, twenty six years ago, there was no outsourced construction management company. There was none. You, you, you know, I would call. You know, I, I had worked for all these brands, and I realized that I kept working myself out of a job. Right. Every time I'd go build a new chain or go build a new thing, and every once in a while I, I, I get that knock on my door, my boss would come in and go, Anthony, I'd sit down, and they all kind of get that same look on their face. Look, there's nothing you've done wrong, but we're going to have to let you go. What, what, what? I just worked my ass off for you for the last years, whatever that was, and now you're going to let me go? Well, yeah, we're not going to build anymore. The brand's you know, kind of made its back. You know, we're not going to grow. It's, we've kind of got to. Great. I got that. And one day I realized, okay, I love doing development. I love doing the deal. I love looking for sites. I love uh, negotiating entitlements. I love negotiating the deal. I love going through the process. There's a passion I have for yeah. taking dirt or taking a property and reinvesting I, as you do, right? When you and I talk, I can really hear your passion in the development deals that you do, right? When I listen to your podcast, the people that are on your podcast really are up to developing amazing properties. Yeah. Right now, the question becomes, is, all right, how do I do the same thing for multiple companies, and that's where CDO started. CDO Group was really uh, uh, designed under two two words, uh, two uh, kind of a double plan words. It was Chief Development Officer, right? Kind of everything that fell under the Chief Development Officer's uh, role for a company, like uh, Boston Market or Einstein Bagels or, or Discovery Zone, whatever that person's role was, right? The Chief Development Officer, that team would be underneath them. That's what CDO is gonna do on an outsourcing basis. I mean, you pay us a fee and we'll do that work for you. And you could focus on your primary business. If it was renting videotapes or selling chicken or selling uh, uh, bagels, you could focus on your business and we would focus on your development needs. And the second play of that word was corporate development outsourcing, right? It was essentially uh, outsourcing your development needs to a, a third party company. Again, going back to allow them to do that. And if, if, at first when I'd call people, you got to remember, there were people that were invested in doing it the old way, right? And I mean, when I was at Discovery Zone, we had a $5 million a year budget for the development team. That was just for the, not for the money we spent to build the stores. That was just yeah. for the team itself. That's for the people and the lawyers and the team and all the staff and the offices and all the stuff it took to run that development team. And you think about as a company that really was there to make playgrounds, why are you buying cows to get milk? Just buy the milk, right? You, you want the playground, <laughs> right? And at the end of the day, those are capital expenditures that hit your bottom line where I can take 
the development cost of a team that I outsource to, and I can capitalize that against the project. Same cost, but now I'm just moving it from a general expense to over to a capitalized expense, and it just hits me taxation-wise in a much better way. That is amazing. I So you are operating as a third party for these large corporations, and you work with a lot of them to facilitate the, the building of their units and buildings to grow their operation and they don't have to necessarily have to hire and build that internally. That's right. So, so for us, when you're, when you're doing brands, right, when you're building brands, for me, it's always the same thing, right? As we look at real estate and we look at a brand that says, Hey, I want to, I would like to build a hundred new locations this year, right? For us, there's a process by which we do that. And it doesn't matter if we're going to build a hundred dog houses or we're going to build a hundred skyscrapers. The process that we follow is always the same. Now, if you understand something about most real estate people, they show up like cowboys. Same thing with construction people, right? Real estate and construction people for hundreds, maybe even thousands of years now have showed up at their projects like cowboys. And if you're a well-seasoned uh, real estate expert, maybe you can sit there and, 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 and you know, pull guns from your hip and, and play cowboy, right? Yeah. You have a shot at that. But the truth is, if you get a win, you don't deserve it. You'll, you may get it, but you don't really deserve it, right? If we don't follow a process right? A proven process that takes us through the looking at the prop. How do we go out and look for property to begin with, right? What's the property we look for, right? So I, I'll give you some examples a little bit, right? The, the number, you know, when, when I look at a real estate deal, let's say that we're building today, I'm building, I was in a meeting with Panda earlier today, right? We're building pandas all around the country, right? It, the, I can go in and squeeze an electrician, a plumber, an HVAC person. I might be able to squeeze them for a couple percent here or there, right? To save some money on, on negotiating a bid. But yeah. where I save them thousands of dollars is when I go negotiate for a better delivery of the property. If it's a ground up building, where are all my utilities coming from, right? Where's my sewer, water, gas, electric, right? What, what, what am I entitlement process? Am I going to go through hearing after hearing? Am I going to, where's the soil at? What's going on with the property itself? Is this site already pad ready? Right. In other words, is all the development work done on there? Do I have to raise or lower it? Right. That could be hundreds of thousands of dollars in development cost. And how I get the build, how I get the, the dirt or how I get, if it's an interior build out, like I'm, we're building one that's in, in a shopping mall, right? I get what's called a landlord work letter, right? And, you know, a lot of times when you're going to rent a space as a, let's say you're a, a, a sandwich shop or let's say, Daniel, you and I decide that we want to build the world's best sub shop. Daniel, you've got the world's best bread. You, 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 you've got a recipe that's been handed down from your, your, your grandmother and her grandmother. It's the kind of bread that when you're done, you lick your fingers because you touch the bread. <laughs> right? Right, right, right. Can we can yeah. imagine that? Like, like that's the bread. That's how good that bread is. Right. Yeah. And I have the best cold cuts and I'm, I'm, I think I can do customer service really well. And together we're going to put them together. We're going to make Daniel and Anthony's greatest, greatest sandwich shop ever created on the planet. Right. We're, that's, we, we've got an idea. Right. And yeah. as we go to look for locations to put Daniel and Anthony's best uh, shop, there's a couple of things that we're looking for. Number one, we want to find the best place to put it based on what's in the market area. Right. So we, we do what's called a trade area analysis. Right. We don't want to go because look, every broker I've ever met, when I tell them I want to build Daniel and Anthony's uh, perfect, uh, greatest chamber shop ever created, what are they going to tell you? They've got the perfect location in their, in their uh, MLS. They've, uh, they've, they've got your perfect look. They know that you, they've got your perfect location. Right. Because okay. what, what do they want? What do they get out of it? So this this would be based off like foot, a trade area analysis would provide like foot traffic, car count. It provide those demographics, population density, population within walking distance. It might do all that stuff. That's right. That's ex exactly. Right. In fact, I'm going to tell you what's coming to us now, where AI is really going to bring the the real estate world. It's okay. going to blow us all away. Right here. Imagine when I was a kid, you would sit on a corner and you'd have like one stop, a one counter that would count cars driving by and the other one would have people walking by and you might have something for where's the hospitals where's the churches where's the schools where's the offices you might create a little algorithm on a spreadsheet and you might have 15 or 18 or let's say 25 characteristics of a marketplace mm -hmm. and that would give you your best idea to build paint a picture of what that development site uh, will perform right based on those 25 characteristics well, just imagine what's about to come to us is 
10,000 X that number, right? Imagine AI can now bring together all of the cell phone records and travel counts and soccer games and, and hot, uh, uh, parades and, and, and start to know a, a demographic so good that we couldn't ever, we, we, we could, we would look at the algorithm and not even be able to understand it. Right. Imagine that the demographic model that's coming to us will give you when people are going, what, what kind of people are there? What are the people that go by there? How to get, how to communicate with those people, right? Cause up until now, if you wanted to market Daniel and Anthony's a sandwich shop, we had to market to a hundred percent of all the people, right? Mm -hmm. We had to go out on TV. We had to go, right. And it costs us a lot of money for maybe, let's say it's only 3% of the mar marketplace that will go eat Daniel and Anthony. They eat subs, maybe three, you know, maybe say, let's say it's 10% of the marketplace eat subs. The other 90% could give, give a crap about subs. Right, they're, yeah. they're, they're not gonna get a shot with them. But our goal is to figure out where are the people, where's that 10% of people that want it? Now the problem is I gotta market to 100% of the people to do that. But what's coming today with social media and social media impact is I can start to model people in a much smarter way. Now I can take my advertising dollars and go to the people that will eat subs. Right, you know, it might be moms that are on their way to a soccer game. It might be it might be dads on, a, on the way to work or, or uh, on the way home. It might be moms. Uh, that are that are you know coming home from the boardroom and they want to get the board uh, you know they're, they're going to work late tonight and their board meeting might go a little late and they might decide tonight we're going to get some subs for the board meeting or whatever whatever they're doing right today the amount of information that we're going to have on each and every human being it's getting a lot smarter than ever before and artificial intelligence will help us market to those people a lot better than ever before. At the same time, it'll be able to look at the demographic modeling and what's happening in that marketplace with other people that are selling subs, right? How they're performing. Right? It'll also help you look at what's your availability for human beings to come work for you, right? Nothing worse than going to marketplaces where you can't remember where you, where you grew up. It was yep. hard to find great employees there because the marketplace was so small, yep. right? And a lot of times they had to go to bottom feed to find employees that really didn't perform very well, right? Imagine being able to look at markets and go, yeah, maybe you don't want to go here. Maybe. I'm not taking my broker's word for it. I want to take that 10,000 X demographic model and go look for where I can perform better. Maybe if I just move it over a couple of markets, I can shift my pro probability of being successful by 10 X. And there's where in lies the smart that's coming down the pipeline, our opportunity, right? That's where our opportunities are with the algorithms and, and the AI models that are coming to us right now. It's, it's never going to be better than it is now. At first, people are going to get scared to go, oh my God, it's Terminator, the finger. Remember the finger from the movie? You watch Terminator, they're, like, they're going to take over, right? Skynet's going to kill us all. And the truth is, that's not going to happen. Well, probably not going to happen. I, I can't promise that, but that's not going to happen. What's going to happen is we'll have a much better way of looking at demographic models and and that all spill into the construction world as well, which we'll, we'll hit on a little bit later. So are you actually working or people working on that for you and bringing that to you right now? Because this, it seems like it would benefit you the most because you having the demographics working with billion dollar companies, it seems like it would benefit you the most because if you're working as their development, development person, I think that would help you. So absolutely. Look today, you know, there are, uh, we, we did a podcast the other day with site and okay. they're a great company, right? They're, they're, the amount of information that they're being able to capture on each location that's out there, it's never been better than it was before. Now, imagine this, that that's, you know, where AI is going, that, okay. that's, that's where real estate starts, right? We start to learn that with blockchain technology, we're going to be able to capture all the information about a piece of property, right? And keep it with the property. Up until now, you know, every time we went and develop a piece of property, we'd go build the property, right? We'd go find it. We'd start the entitlement process. We do a set of uh, civil drawings. We do architectural drawings. We do our engineering drawings, and then we build it. And we take all that information that we gathered and we put it in some shelf somewhere, and we forget that it ever existed. And the next time someone wants to come to that property, we have to start all over again. Oh. Right, right. And then, and and we never keep the information with it. Well, what's about to happen is we're smart to implement blockchain technology into every property. So everything that ever goes to that property, every sale that's ever made, every every brick that's ever brought there, every yard of cement that gets poured there, the information we know about the dirt, the compaction, the type of dirt, the sill, the the the, the construction progress photos, all the data that's collected during the project and after the project will stay with the project and, and make that and make that product property even more intelligent as we move forward. Right? Imagine that in the future, 
artificial intelligence will be able to do drawings, right? Imagine that yeah. architects will really change from being drawing related, right? Which is the worst part of their job. Making the drawings is, ask any architect, doing yeah. the drawings is the worst part of their job. It's time consuming. It's labor intensive. It's painful. They're, they love being creative. It's mental. Right? Right. It's a mental, right. It's a mental game because the coordination between all the different pages rarely works out. Dan, do you understand the difference between AutoCAD and Revit? Nah, no. <laughs> okay. So AutoCAD, if you're working with AutoCAD and today, uh, electronic, it's electronic auto, uh, design, you know, back in the old days, uh, they had plans and called them blueprints. Why they're called blueprints was literally as you drove, drew on them, right. You were kind of scraping off the blue and you, you the print was blue and where you drew on it, we became white and that, that became your set of drawings. Okay. Right. And it, today we draw with AutoCAD, right. And AutoCAD is really electronic uh, design. Now from AutoCAD, they own a company called Revit. Now in AutoCAD, when I draw a line, right, on that line, that represents a wall, right? So right here or whatever, if I'm drawing a, a, a base building, a line may represent a wall. And I would go to another page, like, you know, on my architectural drawings, to show the details of where the wall goes. Right? This is going to be seven feet long. It's going to go here. There's another wall that's eight feet long, and it's going to connect to this wall. And and you can see that on the drawings. And, I'm, and I might go to a separate page, and I'll see what the wall type is. Well, the wall type yeah. A might be drywall on one side, metal studs in the middle, uh, brick on the outside. Yeah. Uh, this wall over here might be drywall on one side, uh, uh, metal studs in the middle. Uh, it might be drive it on the outside or EFIS or, or some other finish. Uh, I might go to wall type C, and it might be drywall, metal stud, drywall, right? It might be an interior partition wall, right? So in... AutoCAD, the drawings are, have kits of parts that you have to go and decipher. Well, in Revit, it's a little bit different. When I draw a wall, I create what's called a family. That wall type is represented by the parts that make the wall. All right, so just imagine this. When I draw the wall, I have the bottom track, the two screws that hold the, 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 the stud up, right? the two screws at the top, and the top track. Then I've got the drywall, the screws that hold the drywall on, the mud that holds the, uh, that, that glues the drywalls to get together and loses my seams and my screws, right? All of that gets created in a family as I build that wall type. Now, so you get an estimate. That's right. At the I, so I, I get a takeoff of all the materials that I need. Woo. Where the where what's really going to be amazing is that I could also have the costing, right? AI will allow me to open the API that goes to Home Depot and Lowe's and, and look at product availability that'll fit my scope, right? And it'll be able to help me find the products I need to build my build out. And while it's designing it, it'll also be pricing it. And it'll also make sure that product availability is there. Because, Danny, what's the worst part about construction? The people. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. It's it's the materials, people, and men, co cohesive, working, binding it all together. And well, you know what? You know why? We're all liars. 100%. You know why? We, we all lie to each other, right? We, we literally, to get a project, right? We're going to be with Daniel and Anthony's uh, sub shop. You and I go to an architect. We hire an architect. We beg him to give us uh, plans for a cheaper price. And they go, okay, I, I should charge you 25000 but I'm going to charge you 15000 because I like you too. But the problem is now they build plans that are only $15,000 worth, right? The DNA that people are going to build from they we've we've shorted the guy who's going to build you know build that now everybody else who gets involved doesn't have enough information to do it properly now you and I, you and i build, we we go to bid dan you go i got my uncle bob i got my my cousin bruce and i go i got these three contractors over here we find what's that <laughs> and i got a hammer to make it even cheaper <laughs> that's right and i got a, here i'm going to do it myself right i'm going to do it myself and it's even better right now now i'm going to do it, i'm going to do it myself right i've got all the time in the world i can do it myself now I go to bid and we get, you know, imagine we're in our sub shop. There's 20 different subs. You got a flooring guy, you got a lighting guy, you got an electrician, you got a plumber, you got a painter, you got a, a mayor mural or a mill worker. Yeah. Right. We've got all kinds of subs. Say we got 20 different subs in there. Right. And, and for us, we, we want to win the bid. So we might have three subs for every line item. I right? just imagine, right. I, I want three plumbers. Right, so I want to get me. I want to win the project at CD. I want to win the project, so I get three different plumbers. So I can look at all, all their numbers and see which one's the right number. I look at three different electricians. Let's say that it takes each of those subcontractors a thousand dollars to bid for us. All right, stop their day, get the plans printed out, pull it out, do a takeoff, sit down, call the supply house. All let's say it costs them a thousand bucks. Right, let's say it takes each general contractor 
like three or four thousand bucks to put the bids together, stop their time, take their day, put the bids together, submit to the customer, you know, uh, submit our, our request for information, RFIs, you know, all the stuff that comes along from the subcontractors, negotiate the bid, put them all together on a bid spreadsheet and submit it. Let's say it costs them three to five thousand bucks. Now, imagine that's 60 subs per general contractor at a thousand bucks a piece. That's sixty thousand dollars times five contractors that we bid to, right? That's three hundred thousand dollars in work that the industry got sucked out of it, and no one's won a job yet. Now, you have a friend. Your your friend comes in and says, "I could do it for two hundred thousand dollars," and Bruce comes in and says, "I could do it for one hundred eighty thousand dollars." And Mike comes in, guy comes in, one hundred seventy thousand. We have another one, one hundred sixty thousand. And you come in and say, "Now, nah, forget all of you guys. I'm gonna build for a hundred grand." Right now, you're not in business. You just have a hammer. And now you decide to call your friend uh, Bob and, and his friend yeah. Betty, and and they show up when they can, and 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 we start work, but they never quite perform the way they're supposed to. And everybody that you hired has to suffer now because, number one, what you thought you were getting a deal, you never do. The truth is that everybody on that on that on that program gets gets you know they've already remembered they've been in five other projects they've worked on and they've been on and they've already lost their thousand bucks per project right so we're already sucked into a bad deal now you think you can get it done at the price those people show up at the at the deal to try to get the deal done and it's a mess right yeah it's a mess right the the carpenter doesn't get the walls up where they're supposed to like trujans try to to get started but they can't get started because then the walls are finished and the plumbing can't get done and now we can't pass annual inspection what's well, supposed to take eight weeks doesn't it takes us you know 25 weeks now i'm paying rent on a location that hasn't even opened yet daniel and anthony are already paying rent right now we, we've already got you know five or ten months of rent that we're paying on a space that we haven't even occupied yet now, everywhere along the way, the industry gets hurt for that, right? And that's what makes the group. Now, artificial intelligence is about to change all that, right? Imagine that in the design, right, as it designs the prop, prop projects, right, it specs out all the parts and pieces. It'll also be able to create schedules. And not only that, it'll be able to go to the marketplace where there'll be no more electrical companies. There'll be no more electricians. There'll be no more plumbers. There'll be no more HVAC companies. There'll be individuals that know how to do the work. And just like Uber did the taxi companies, It'll go to the player and say, hey, Mr. Player, you're a five-star plumber. You get first pick at this. And if five-star plumbers will want to maintain their five-starness, just like Uber wants to maintain their five-star, they have water and they have a charger. And every time you get an Uber, it's clean, right? Because that guy wants a 4.9 or 5. He wants a 5 rating every time you leave that, that thing. And he wants that 20% tip. Well, the same thing will happen with the, the plumbers, the electricians, the HVAC people. AI will develop the scope. It'll buy the materials. It'll have it delivered to a job site. It'll even train you when we use new products on how to do that the way that you learn best. Dan, imagine this: that you like to you like to watch videos while you're eating your cereal in the morning, and you learn best doing that. Or maybe I don't. I like to watch videos when I'm on the crapper, right? Yeah. Or maybe I like to watch them in bed before I go to sleep at night. Or maybe yeah. I like to learn it in the movies that I watch. AI will be able to take the learning about whatever the new plumbing product is that we're going to use. Maybe it's a clamp on or a new crimp or a new, a new valve and how it gets installed and they'll integrate it into the way that we learn best. Right. Imagine, imagine how that changes for humans as we, as this whole, this whole construction world changes dramatically. Right. We're about to enter into a whole new field of that. So that's what's really exciting about it. Right. And now our opportunity as developers is to really to look at how can we be part of really creating that? You know, when I met with you and your partner and what you guys are doing over there, you're putting together some really interesting real estate deals, right? To continue to look at not the old way our grandfathers did it, right? Yeah. I, I could keep building the way that my grandfather did it. And I've got family members that were in Rome where they built the Colosseum, you know, just like for most of my career, we've carried very heavy shit over to a, a space. We, we banged on it. And we called that construction. Well, today we're, we're called in to do it much, much smarter. I, imagine a future where, when, when a company like uh, uh, Daniel and Anthony's sub shop wants to grow, the second that we have an idea, they'll be able to tell us where the best place to open is, how much it's going to cost us, when we're going to need cash to pay who, and what our, what our projections are for that. Well, we might have a couple little things that we could change. We might decide that we could, we could move when we want to open. Like let's say that we want to open before Christmas. 
And there's always a rush because retail is always kind of rushing to ca capture the Christmas holiday. And they may say, Anthony, if you open by Christmas, it's going to cost you $400,000. But if you move this over to opening up in January, when the drop happens after, after the holidays, you might be able to do that same exact project for $325,000. Now, you and I may decide, hey, I want to capture the Christmas business. It's absolutely what we want to do. We'll be there. We, we want to do that. Great. And we might decide to leave the slide there to open for Christmas. But we also may have another slide that says, all right, we want to be green about it, right? We might make a slide that we slide and says, all right, we want to be as green as possible. We want to make sure we have no carbon footprint. We want to use solar everything. We're going to find. And that might adjust some of the numbers or pricing a little bit, right? We might be more altruistic about it. And that's the things that AI is going to give us the ability to look at how our decisions we're making will impact our schedule, our cost in the moment that it happens. Imagine that we make a decision to open 10 shops. It'll tell us exactly what our cash outlay is going to be, how to hire, who, how that marketplace looks for people we want to hire. What's our availability for great people, people that are trained. And we might be able to look at, all right, if we look for five-star employees, we should open it and figure that, you know, we can, we can open in, in November. We'll be ready for the Christmas holiday. And here's what's going to cost us to hire those five-star employees. You may go, hey, um, you know, it's a smaller sub shop. I could probably do four-star employees. You know, that's your decision to make. And I can do a better job of training. And I'll, my job will be to move them to five-star plumber, uh, uh, five-star employees. And those will be all the gifts that we'll have in creating the future that's getting pretty It's getting really dynamic around here. It is. One of the craziest things to me is that I think the tech, and this is where like there's there's age businesses where technology hasn't came in and re reformatted them. So I think when the when the communication of systems, people, and bids all that come together, because I think there's so there's a million variables in one transaction because you have all the moving parts that if you can actively keep track imagine raising capital for that when you just draw on the first and the 15th and when we're good for 45 days imagine that your accounting your accounting person is going to be your cfo is going to be like in the clouds this is amazing <laughs> well I, I, imagine having pay applications done before you start a project That's you know today we, we we work on at cdo we work on creating schedules and we tell our teams to, to literally drive your schedule by having your subcontractor build the pay application when you start it. You know, in other words, we bill up clients, let's say on the 25th of every month. In fact, that, uh, that was the conversation we had today, right? Today's the 25th and we're, we're taping this, it's 25th. And we, we, we go back and look at what subcontractors haven't billed us. Now, one of the flaws of that is that the great subcontractors are working all day, right? They're out in the field, they're working, they forget it. But if we miss their billing, and we don't get it in this month, they may not get paid until the next month. And that may really hurt somebody. And then ultimately, what does that do? It hurts us because what happens to subcontractors is they stop coming to your job and they don't get paid. Yep. So my one is that we're if, if we're if we need their sub their invoice in by the 25th, that we're working on the 15th to make sure that that arrives. In fact, we're even we're even forecasting where they're gonna be. And for me, I try to pull them into the future. Right. I'll tell them, hey, listen, Mr. Mr. Electrician, I want an in-wall inspection by the 25th. Now, the guy may be really, it might be the 27th or 28th, but we know that if we if we can pull them into that, I'll pay them up to that in-wall inspection and then I kind of pull them into that. And hey, by the way, I'll have you payment out for that much, much farther. So I'm going to let you bill me a little bit further on the 15th, knowing that you're not quite there yet. But by the 25th, when that inspector comes out to inspect it for the bank, I need to make sure you've passed your in-wall inspection or your pay application will be denied. I, what I actually end up doing is I end up pulling a subcontractor into a future that gets created, right? Rather than pushing them out of, get it done or I'm going to hate you, right? That really works. When I pull them into, hey, by the way, you're going to get paid up until here. I just need that inspector to show up and see that you got your annual inspection, right? It's a, it, it pulls them into a future that's exciting rather than pushing them out of fear, but like, hey, if I don't get it done, you're going to, I'm never going to use you again, or, you know, all that fear based stuff that we've always done when we were the kind of lower, lower me uh, when, I, when, I'm, when I'm building, you know, building great relationships with subcontractors. I love, for everybody who's listening to that, I hope you took notes because I think that's that's your experience talking because I think a lot of people play that play that game and you're just burning relationships. And I think the business is built off relationships. And I think you're incentivizing people to complete the job in a timely manner and paying them for it. So it's a win-win situation. So you, you actually can hit your deadlines because you have a job to do. 
That's right. All the brands we work with, we tell them this every day. Look, you want us to be successful. You can't mess around with payments. You know, yep. uh, we, I, this morning I got a, I got an offer from a client uh, to for a hundred thousand dollar bonus. Right this morning, he said, "We'll give you a hundred thousand dollar bonus if you open our store by Thanksgiving." Right, we have 121 days from today to open that store, ground up building, right? Yeah. And we literally put we're, this morning we're putting the silt fence in to start doing the outline of it. 121 days. Now, that's a really, really aggressive schedule for a ground up building in today's environment, right? Yeah. It's weather, nights and weekends. That's going to take some work from the team to really develop that. Now, in order for that to be really successful, right? I sat down with the team today. We can't miss a day. Right. So most construction projects, we get awarded, people get awarded projects and they spend the next three or four, it it may even take a month before they even get all the contracts issued. And that can't happen when you have 121 days, right? You need to get all of your subs lined up and we need to make sure that all of them can see the vision of what we're doing, right? To ask a subcontractor to come work a weekend, right? When you, when you, when you're sitting around Thursday or Friday, you're saying, I need you to work this weekend. It's too late, right? Subcontractors have families and, and jobs and picnics to go to and family get togethers. But if you say to them, when you're bidding the project, hey, this is going to be a seven day a week project. I need you to have the team and staff on board to make that happen seven days a week, right? They can start to plan and they can figure out, hey, Bob's got this weekend, Betty's got next weekend, Bruce has got the following weekend, right? And we can spread the load out over our team. And we can keep that project going as committed for CDO group, right? A much different way of looking at it. It's not the old days when, when two guys sat out there like cowboys shooting from the hip. You got to, you know, most of our decision logic has got to move to the front of the, of the project. And that's, what's really going to help us with artificial intelligence, like, like Revit, right? When, when you build in Revit, right? Since it's a 3d model, you can't do the next segment unless the first one's right. In other words, you can't build a wall that, that, that intersects into another wall because the model will bump into each other, mm-hmm. right? And what you're doing is you're taking that information that we used to figure out in the field, right? Most of us sat in the field and solved all the problems in the field. Yep. What we're trying to do now is move that information back to the boardroom or back to the estimating room, right? So we can see that information. And that takes getting a set of drawings and building, you know, spending more time on the architectural drawings, and understand the base building before we ever get started. Because if we don't, when when AI starts to develop their schedule, it won't be able to count on, if it doesn't have the original base building drawings done digitally, and we're using a, a paper drawing or we're using an old drawing that's ar- archaic, right? If those building, that building wasn't built digitally in, in Revit to begin with, right? Or a Revit type uh, a model, a 3D model, it won't be able to trust the base building drawings, which ultimately will put impact to their long-term schedule, right? AI, in order for it to be delivered and create schedules it can count on, it's going to understand the, the building better and it's got, it's got to be able to understand the supply chain better. Wow. That is insane. That is insane. I, I'm, I'm excited for the future and I think it's going to develop into something that you – I think we're starting to see, but we don't even understand what could happen and talk about possibly change even that future because I think the technology, even from the last 10, 15 years, has accelerated so quickly. So we might have a different conversation a year from now, and it might look t- totally different. <laughs> for sure. Well, Dan, come on. For sure it will. You know, look, when as this unfolds, we can't see what's around the corner. I mean, just, just remember. The guys who were driving stagecoaches, right? Remember guys who were, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, They're they're on top there with their fingers all leathered and they know horses and they know where the Indians are and they know the, they know the, the, the the wild wild west, right? They know that well, right? They could never imagined when a car came by, right? The first time, imagine the first time you saw a car. What's that? Damn, that thing's going to kill people. It smells and it's impacting things and that thing's going to, that thing's going to kill people. Right, you can imagine. I don't know why they're talking with Southern accent. All of a sudden, I got a Southern accent there. <laughs> but, you know, they imagine that. For, but they could never have imagined that later on in life, you'd have a piece of plastic in your hand and you could you could poke at it a few times, and, and another car would show up. They couldn't have imagined that. Today, where we stand and what we're talking about now, is great. It's a vision for maybe we could see something, 
But where this is about to go is even more dynamic than that. And I behoove all of the people that are listening to us right now to get more conscious, to get more focused, to get more intentional about their day, to really step into their businesses and their focus and look at all the new changing technology like a gift, right? Because there's a gift to be exploited. And those who exploit the AI gift will separate from the rest of the pack so fast that the other group won't be able to catch on. Very similar to what the French, the English, the Portuguese did with shipping. Right, they all these little tiny countries took over massive amounts of the world because they exploited a technology called shipping, right? And that's what we got to do today. Is as we go into this next segment of the, of the world, we need to start looking at how can we exploit the opportunity of artificial intelligence as it impacts and quantum computing as it starts to impact our future development. Boom! That is amazing. Where can people find you online and uh, tell us about your podcast, the Future Factory Podcast? This has been an amazing episode. I really appreciate your time. Daniel, anytime. As always, uh, love the audience. Come by and see Future Factory Podcast. We're on all the major streaming applications. We're on YouTube. Uh, If you come over, make sure you tell me you're uh, from Daniel's podcast. I'd love to have your guest here. I love, first of all, I'm grateful that you invited me on the show. I love your show and the work that you're doing. It's amazing work. You know, it's insightful. It's creative. I love the ideas about uh, real estate and how to, how to uh, uh, you know, do different ideas with real estate. So I, I love it. They can find me at Future Factory or you can get me on LinkedIn, Anthony Montategui at LinkedIn. I'm sure Daniel put the link down below and all the, you know, classic, uh, you know, social media platforms. There you go. I appreciate your time. Thank you, Anthony, Anthony for coming on. For everybody here, you know what to do. Go like, share, subscribe. You know what to do. We'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in, guys. Bye. Hey, guys. If you would like to receive hot leads right to your cell phone in a text message, check out hiveleads.io and you can receive the same leads we've been receiving in our campaign for three and a half years that's made us successful in the land game. Check us out. Yeah, I think the dark side of entrepreneurship is not talked about enough. I think that most people, when they think about business entrepreneurship, they think of the fact that teaming on...